Uh, right then, brethren, for the last two or three weeks, I guess, we've been looking at the topic of the fear of God. Some people don't like the term the fear of God and they prefer sort of a awe or deep respect. Well, I'm not entirely convinced, but the fear of God, I think, is quite an easy term to understand. And what we've said the last few weeks is there's not much around. You look around in the world, there is not much fear of God anywhere, is there? And that would include, uh, I hate to say it, even a number of churches don't really fear God. Part of the reason, I think, is, well, first of all, not many people in our societies actually even believe in God in the first place because they've grown up being taught that science and evolution has uh, all the answers. You don't need a God. You don't need a Bible. In fact, science contradicts, allegedly, the Bible. So a lot of people don't even believe there is a God. But those who do believe there's a God, those who've got a sort of a church-type background or perhaps, you know, came through a church-type family, people who believe in God still, in many, many cases, don't fear that God because the God they've heard of is quite a weak God. He's a nice God, like a sort of an old lovey-dovey granddad figure who loves everybody all the time, wouldn't say boo to a goose. And of course, neither do I for that matter. But why would you fear such a lovey-dovey God that loves everybody? And as we've said before, some people recognize that the Bible does refer to the fear of God, but they try and push that into the, the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, that's gentle Jesus, meek and mild. The New Testament talks about love and grace. You know, God's unconditional love. You'll hear that God loves you, irrespective. There's nothing you can do that could make God love you more. There's nothing you can do that would make God love you less. God's love is unconditional. Right. And some of these people will say, and we shouldn't preach about sin and judgment. Hellfire. These are offensive terms. We might lose our tithe pairs and donors. No, they don't actually say that. But I think that's behind the scenes <laughs> what they're thinking about. And they'll say, well, we've got scriptural evidence. The scriptures tell us in Romans chapter two, the goodness of God leads people to repentance. So what we do is we talk to people out there in the world about how good God is. God may hate the sin, but loves the sinner. God's love is unconditional. There's nothing you can do that will make God love you any less. And we preach about the goodness of God. God wants you to have that beach vacation in Hawaii. God wants you to have that BMW Series 7. God wants you to be promoted to be the CEO of your company. God wants all these good things and we preach the good things of God to bring people to repentance. Well, look around the world. How well is that doing, right? But we said last week, uh, last week we were focusing, well, okay, uh, but what did Jesus preach? When Jesus was here on the earth, what message did he preach? And I'm sure he covered a, a range of topics. But last week we focused on the fact that Jesus preached about hellfire. In fact, Jesus was the first and probably the, the best of the hell fire preachers, which a lot of TV evangelists and other church leaders today will shun well, because judgment and hellfire, ooh, that's dodgy. We don't want to touch on that. We're all about being inclusive and diverse and everybody's welcome. Not with Jesus preaching, it wasn't. Let's just uh, recap in three places. They're all in the book of Matthew. If you turn to Matthew chapter 18, and all three passages will be in this book, so not too much flipping around. Matthew 18 and verses 7 through 9. And uh, here Jesus uh, speaking to his disciples, right? And says, woe to the world because of offenses or stumbling blocks. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Well, that's an interesting start, isn't it? Woe to the world. That's like bad things are coming to this world, guys. And bad things are coming to the man that's involved in this. Woe. Carrying on, verse 8. 
If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. So Jesus says, look, guys, and the big gals as well, of course, uh, anything that gets between you and the kingdom, you need to get rid of it, even if it was your hand or your foot. No matter what it is, get rid of it. Otherwise, you're in danger of being cast into the everlasting fire. Two different words there, everlasting and fire, hot, <laughs> burns up. Everlasting fire is Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He says, you guys, if you don't watch out, if you make some mistakes here, some really serious ones, you'll end up in everlasting fire where clearly you'll be burned up. Carry on. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hell fire. Hell is the word Gehenna, fire is the word fire. So again, hand, foot, eye, if these things lead you into sin, get rid of them, because that's better than being cast, as it says here, into Gehenna fire, into hell fire. So like we said last week, Jesus is a hell fire preacher. Look at uh, chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew 25, and we'll read verses 41 to 46. So here Jesus has been giving a parable about the sheep and the goats. And the sheep go on one side, goats on the other. The sheep are introduced into the kingdom of God, as actually representing, of course, good people. But what about the goats? What about the bad people? Well, let's look at verse 41 through 46. Then Jesus will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So these people who are unqualified will be cast into everlasting fire. A fire that's good enough to take care of the devil and his angels, certainly take care of a human being. Carrying on. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. I guess these people were very selfish, not concerned about, about others. Um, I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And then they also, the goats, will answer him saying, Lord, you know, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, won't count. And there's some of them. They will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? Then he, you know, the, uh, the king will say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these goats will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. One group, eternal life. Other group, eternal punishment. They'll be punished and there's no way back. You don't come back from that. You're punished. That's over, out, terminated, end of story. So here's Jesus, verse 41, talking about everlasting fire because Jesus, at least some of the time, preached about hellfire and punishment, all right? It wasn't all just gentle Jesus, blessings everywhere, and here's the more bread and fish, you know, like the Apostle Paul. Jesus talked about the goodness and severity of God. It's not just goodness. There's a bit of a balance here, the goodness and severity of God. And here's some of the severity, hellfire, at judgment time. Let's look uh, at uh, Matthew chapter, oh, we're in 25. So let's look at verses 26 to 30. So this is the parable of the talents. And uh, two good guys went out, multiplied the talents, were blessed by the king. But then there was uh, one unprofitable servant 
who did nothing, diddly squat. We pick up the story there in verse 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew, did you, that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Is that really your opinion of me? Therefore you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. That's the least you could have done. It doesn't take any great risk on your part, but I would have got something back for my investment. You didn't even do that. Lazy servant, wicked servant. Verse 29 or verse 28. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that doesn't say hellfire there, but you can see it nonetheless is a horrible punishment. The unprofitable servant, hopefully not us, is cast out into outer darkness. Nothing, just blackness. I guess that's termination. But on the way there, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, weeping tends to suggest, you know, sorrow, uh, recognition of what you've lost. And some people here, I guess, realize that they did have available eternal life and glory with, with God forever, and they've lost it. And so now they're weeping, now they're distraught. Others, it says, gnashing of teeth, which typically pictures rage, wrath, anger. And these people, even at this stage, are bitter and twisted and hate-filled, filled with fury against their creator and judge. So weeping, gnashing of teeth in outer darkness. Again, you know, punishment. So plus what we looked at last week, you can see that Jesus was actually rather plain in his preaching. There is coming a judgment. For some people, good. For some people, it's a bad, calamitous judgment. You know, and Jesus wants people to fear God for good reasons. Fear God, avoid all the bad things, live right, and then you can avoid hellfire and darkness. Please, fear God. Then you won't be in danger of hellfire. And hopefully we should understand that the fear of God actually is, is good for anybody. And we can see that if we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5, which I think we read maybe two or three weeks ago. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. So Moses has been recounting to the people here 40 years on about the initial giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and he's talking about that to them and verse 28 and 29 he says Then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me and the Lord said to me I've heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you they are right in all that they have spoken Oh, you can see, you know, God's, God's heart here, the feeling coming out of God's heart. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So God's just saying, oh, if only, if only they had a heart that would fear me because then they would fear to disobey me. Then they would choose my commandments, which are for their blessing and for their good and for their prosperity and for their peace and for their well-being. If they feared me, it would lead to prosperity and peace and harmony and joy and a long, long life in the land of milk and honey. If they feared me. And of course, that's what the fear is for. Fear is not a bad thing. The fear of God leads to a good thing. And Jesus was pretty much covering the same ground. He's preaching hellfire so that people don't go to hellfire. So that they would fear him. Like Jesus said, you know, fear him who after he has killed the body can kill the soul in hellfire. That's whom you are to fear. 
But a right fear leads to right behavior, leads to a great future, and of course avoiding hellfire. Now, it just seems today that if you look at many churches, many TV evangelists, in general I'm talking, of course there's exceptions, you'll find that typically the gospel message today is almost emasculated. You know, they take away the hellfire and the sin and judgment and tend to talk over and over and over about, you know, love. God loves you. God just loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you do, what you've done, what you will do. God just loves you and loves you and loves you. And, and they tend to focus on the, you know, the, the good things as they see them in Scripture, that God's unconditional love. And we must avoid sin. And we must avoid the fear of God. And we must avoid talking about righteous judgment because these are bad things and they are offensive to people. And people will get, you know, triggered. This snowflake generation can't take references to hellfire, eternal punishment. Oh my word, palpitations, put the fan on. But Jesus preached that. And I'm pretty convinced that if Jesus came today on the earth preaching, he would not be welcome in many churches because his message is far too offensive to us. We don't want this Jesus Christ here preaching. Terrible. I said last week, you know, some people point out that, you know, if, if Jesus had come teaching the message that many evangelists teach today, Jesus would have never been crucified because the message is so bland, right? Um, you know, many churches today, all they teach is really love. You know, love, love, more love, extra love, special love. Love is all you need. You know, the old Beatles song, love is all you need. Oh, I'm not going to sing it. But you know the song we probably. Enjoy it. Of course, they don't define what they mean by love. It's just some sort of syrupy, smooth, schmaltzy, sentimental, anything goes. We tolerate anything. You know, the one of the favorite scriptures, apart from today's favorite scripture, is judge not. And uh, you get the impression that they even tell God, don't you judge us. I mean, you have to love us. You have to tolerate us. Whatever we do is fine with you, God, because you love everybody all the time in every way. Well, today we're going to review what the Bible says about the love of God. Um, and especially we're going to look at John 3.16, probably the most popular verse in the Bible and endlessly quoted uh, in terms of God's love for everybody all the time, unconditionally and so on. Uh, some people say John 3.16 is actually the gospel in a nutshell. It says God so loved the world. That's the gospel. That's what we need to preach. God loved the world. God loved the world. God so very much loved the world. God loved the world. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's all we need to focus on. Never mind this hellfire and judgment business. Just the love of God. It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. That I'm exaggerating slightly, but that's pretty much what you get from a lot of churches, right? An emasculated gospel only about the love of God, nothing about his severity, right? Now, I would think, you know, being logical, if the message of the Bible is about the love of God, if that's the key message and it's dripping out of every page you turn, love of God, Love of God, love of God. You would expect to be quite a lot of references, right? In the Bible to the love of God because that's the core message. That's the key message, they say. That's their message. That's what they quote over and over and over and over again. So surely the Bible is dripping with references to the love of God, right? Well, actually, wrong. Because... There's actually not very much in the Bible at all about the love of God. If you count all the verses, it's something in the order of approximately one verse in every 1,000 verses that talks about the love of God. Looking through some of the books, you've got, uh, say, the first five books of the Bible, the books that Moses wrote, often referred to as the Torah, Right, the first five books, the Pentateuch. Well, there's um, something like nearly 6,000 verses in the first five books. How many references in, to the love of God? This is the, the works of Moses. This is the, the, the highest regarded of the Old Testament books. 
the writings of the prophet Moses, who spoke face to face with God, 6,000 verses nearly, 5,900, all right? How often the first five books talk about the love of God? Once. One time. In the first five books of the Bible. Then you can look through the prophets, virtually nothing. Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, virtually nothing. The Psalms, not a great deal. Ah, but that's because that's the Old Testament, Jamie. You know, hard, vicious, vindictive God who's into genocide and things like that. But the New Testament, that's where the love of God just comes pouring out. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. New Testament, that's where you find it, Jamie. Well, okay. Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Luke. Zero. No reference. Nil. Nada. Nothing. Oh, I would have thought there'd be some reference there. No. Matthew, Mark, Luke, no references. Book of Acts, well, is an interesting book. Book of Acts is actually telling us the, the history of the early church. Here are the apostles, it's Peter, and of course Paul, and Barnabas, and sundry others. Here they are going out to the world, preaching the gospel, right, to the New Testament world to various different cities across Asia Minor and so on. So here they are. Here's the history. Here's the apostles preaching to the unconverted. So surely the book of Acts will have multiple references as the apostles and others preach the love of God. Um, nil. No reference. Nada. In the epistles, the letters, there's a few references, maybe a handful, not much more than a handful. Book of Revelation, nil. So actually, uh, you look at the New Testament and there's not a lot there at all. The only time you'll find it is in the Gospel of John, which we'll be looking at shortly, and somewhere in John's letters. So the Apostle John is the main guy, right? Um, so out of something like, you know, 31,000 verses in the Bible, 30,000 plus, you have maybe 30 to 40 verses talking about the love of God, which is almost 100% of what some churches, teachers, and evangelists talk about. They talk endlessly, nonstop, about something that barely registers in the Scriptures. And even when it does register in the Scriptures, the love of God, it's usually talking about our love to God, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, might and strength, you know, and worship to God, to love God. And in terms of God's love to, to people, it's virtually always God's love to his elect, to his sons and daughters, God's love to his family, those who are begotten by him, his exclusive family, his dear children. God's love is not addressed pretty much to any believe, unbeliever anywhere. And yet the churches endlessly preach the love of God to the unconverted, to unbelievers, even though really you can't find it in the Bible. It's an entirely made up sort of gospel. Let's turn to John 3.16 and start to look more closely at this verse. <clears throat> because it is... The gospel in a nutshell, they'll tell you. John 3 and verse 16. <clears throat> you could put a marker here. We're going to flip around a little bit, but end up coming back here quite a lot. $50 bill. <clears throat> yeah, if you've got a $50 bill, or I guess with inflation, it should really be a $100 bill now. But John 3, 16. Here's the key verse that you'll see on bumper stickers, uh, mm -hmm. at uh, football stadiums, uh, quoted in magazine articles. This is it. This is the gospel in a nutshell. It's the only verse people know apart from Judge Not. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's what you get. For God so loves the world. That's all you get. No context. They won't read the verses before it. They won't read the verses after it. It's just that verse. 
And really, it's just the first half of that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, blah, 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 everlasting life. That's it. That's, that's the gospel. God gave his son, crucified, shed his blood, died, resurrected up in heaven now, and you believe in him, and that's and you get eternal life, and that's the gospel. There it is in verse 16. For God so loved the world. And what's more, it's in red letters, at least in, in my Bible. So it's a statement that Jesus is making. This is Jesus preaching. Um, but there's a catch or two here, right? When we look at verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world. Now, the way I used to interpret this in my earlier days, up until maybe five or six years ago, I always assumed that simply meant that God so very, 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 very much loved the world. God so loved the world. It was a description of God's massive, comprehensive, total, exhaustive love. For God so loved the world. But it's not. The word soul uh, there is a Greek word, obviously, in the original. It's a Greek huto, H-O-U-T-O. If you're taking notes, we'd write in English huto, H-O-U-T-O. It doesn't mean so very, 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 very much. It means thus. For God thus loved the world. Or in this manner. If you look up Thayer's lexicon, other Greek dictionaries, that's what they'll tell you. It means in this manner. Or thus, not talking about so very, very much, not talking about the width of God's love. You're talking about God loved in a particular manner. For God thus loved the world. And then look at the first uh, word in our English translations, for. For God so loved the world. For God thus loved the world. The word for is what they call a conjunction. It simply joins verse 16 onto the verses that came before that the earlier verses. So it's not that we just open the book of John and it starts with verse 16, right, of chapter 3. It doesn't. Verse 16 says, for, meaning in connection with what just came before that. It's a conjunction. So let's look at the context, right? We're not just going to take one verse out of the middle of the chapter. <laughs> Uh, even if it's in red letters, and say, well, that, that verse stands entirely on its own, so let me preach uh, for our church the, uh, the gospel of Christ from this one verse. Let's do what we should do and get the context, particularly since it says for, which is a conjunction to what comes before. We'll start with uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 and read all the way through to verse 15. That's pretty good. That's the entire context. Because this is a, an episode that took place, you know, one evening in Jesus' life. Uh, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Also, of course, the first Irishman to be mentioned in the Bible, Mr. Nick Odemus. Which is, that's a joke, by the way. He wasn't probably Irish. <laughs> verse 2. This man, Nick Odemus the famous Irishman, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Quite an interesting admission. We Pharisees, as he's talking about himself and his other peers, we Pharisees know you, you come from God. That puts an even more serious light on their condemnation of Jesus from time to time. But moving on, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, oh, Hold on a moment. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Eh, Don't make any sense, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Look, 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered said to him, but how can these things be? He's right baffled. Jesus answered said to him, well, hang on, are you the, you know, it says the, are you the teacher of Israel? And you don't know these, are you the, are you the head teacher? Are you, are you the, the big guy? Are you the custodian of the truth? And you don't know these things, right? And most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness, possibly referring to John Baptist. He was out preaching much that Jesus was preaching. So that might be the, the we, you know, because John Baptist testified that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus, of course, has his own testimony plus the scriptures. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And verses 14 and 15 are probably key to the specific context. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, uh, Hutel, thus, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus has this conversation and towards the end of it, he says, you know what, uh, Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up a bronze serpent on a pole, even so, in this manner, thus, who told, shall the Son of Man be lifted up? That whoever believes in the Son of Man will be saved, delivered, have eternal life. So that's a specific of what you know, Jesus is referring to. It's not just a reference in verse 16, God so loved the world. God loved the world in this manner that had just been spoken of by Jesus about lifting up a serpent on a pole, Jesus being lifted up on a pole. So let's find out the rest of that story. So if you keep your place there, we'll go back to Numbers 21 get the full story of the bronze serpent because that's what Jesus is referring to. That's the, uh, the more remote context for this chapter. So Numbers and uh, Numbers 21 verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> and this of course is the ancient Israelites come through the wilderness endlessly bellyaching. That was their default approach to anything was to whinge and complain. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor, that's like Mount Sinai, uh, by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Well, I mean, did they have the fear of God? <laughs> Do you think they speak against Jehovah? Well, they had no fear of God, did they? And this is, anyway. And of course, also against Moses, saying, Why have you brought, why have you, plural, of course, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. <laughs> the miraculous manna. So these people are ungrateful, uh, caustic, utterly disrespectful to the God who's taken them from slavery in Egypt and is taking them eventually to the promised land, right? So God's not happy. <laughs> so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. So these are these serpents are pretty fatal. Don't know how many there were, but uh, probably quite a lot. And they come zooming out the desert, out the rocks, and they bite the Israelites around the heels and ankles and lower legs, I guess. 
Um, and it says many of the people of Israel died. Was that, was that a few thousand, a few tens of thousands? There's a lot, right? Bad news, which of course gets the attention of the people of Israel. Verses 7 through 9. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, mea culpa, for we have spoken against Jehovah and against you, which they most certainly had done. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, notice uh, the serpents were not taken away, by the way. God says to Moses, make a fiery serpent, you know, an image of one of these fiery serpents, uh, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, like a model, a replica, and put it on a pole and, you know, lifted it up high on the pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anybody who would then, of course, be likely to die, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And the Hebrew implies looked intently at the serpent, gazed at the serpent. And then rather than dying, you'd be delivered from death, right? So in a sense, we can see it quite easily, the uplifted bronze serpent on the pole is a type of Jesus Christ, uplifted, if you like, on a pole. And just as you had, to, if you were, you know, in ancient Israel there in the camp and you were bitten by, by a serpent, you couldn't be automatically healed. You would, you would die. You had to do something. Your healing wasn't automatic. God did not take away the death penalty. Didn't take away the serpents, by the looks of it, at least not initially. But there was a way of escape. There is a pole across the camp there, about half a mile away. And if you walk across the camp to that pole and you look up and gaze intently at the, the bronze serpent on that pole, you'll be delivered from death. You will not die you will enjoy life. And that's what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus, that just as Moses lifted up a serpent on a pole, so the Son of Man will be lifted up on a pole, and people who look to the Son of Man on the pole will be delivered from death. God's making that provision out of his love for, for mankind. Right? So that's the whole context. So let's go back to John chapter 3 and read verses 14 to 16 on this basis. With hopefully a decent understanding of the context from Numbers and the context from Jesus' conversation over a number of verses with Nicodemus. But picking up in verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> And as Jesus says to Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, thus, in this manner, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God, in this manner, loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent to be gazed at, so God the Father is giving his son to be lifted up on a pole, that those who choose to gaze at him and trust in him will be delivered from death, just as ancient Israel was delivered from death when they looked at the bronze serpent you know, that's essentially what the message was. Um, and of course, if you look at John 3.16 while we're here, uh, people tend to focus on the first bit. For God so very, very much loved the world that he gave his only begotten son mm, eternal life. They sort of seem to gloss over the fact that right in the middle of the verse it says, gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So clearly implied there is 
don't believe in him, you will perish. Only those who believe and trust, like in ancient Israel, in, in Numbers 21, if you chose to walk across the camp and made that decision and looked and gazed at the bronze serpent, you were delivered. If you didn't, though, I'm not doing that. That's stupidity. What on earth good can looking at a bronze serpent of a pole do? You know, I'm not falling for that old trick. You'd be dead. You would perish. And here, verse 16 says, Whoever believes in Jesus on the pole will have everlasting life. But obviously, he who does not believe will perish. And the word perish means be destroyed. So that verse, which is so popular with people, it actually says in it, there is destruction for those that don't believe, for those that don't look at the bronze serpent of today, Jesus the Christ. You'll perish. Okay, let's read verses uh, 17 to 18 and 36. So same, just carrying on a little bit further. So 17, 18 and what did I say? 36. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Gaze at the bronze serpent. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this brings out just two verses later. <laughs> That if you don't believe in this individual Jesus the Christ, if you don't believe in the modern type of the bronze serpent on the pole, you are condemned already. Now, people who quote John 3.16 rarely seem to bother about quoting verse 18, or even was internally in verse 16, believe in Jesus Christ and you will not perish. Implied, don't believe, you will perish. Look at verse 36, last verse in the chapter. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Hallelujah and amen. But notice, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Uh, the Amplified Translation says the wrath of God hangs over him continually. So this chapter that people race to, you know, gospel in a nutshell, says in several places, destruction, condemnation. Or here verse 36 says, the person who does not believe, the person who chooses not to go and look and gaze at the bronze serpent on the pole, or at least the modern type, that person, it says, the wrath of God abides or hangs upon him. Right? So here we have pretty plain evidence that even chapter 3 of John that is such a popular chapter well at least one verse is a popular verse the rest of the chapter tends to get ignored even though it says for God so loved a conjunction people don't even look back at the preceding I mean I heard a guy um, uh, he, he was speaking about this in, a, in an audience an English guy uh, English preacher died recently and he said he was in this um, uh, group I think it was a hotel meeting or something and he said, uh, who knows John 3.16? And uh, nearly all the hands go up. He says, who can quote John 3.16? And most of the hands stay up because quite a well-known verse. He says, who can quote John 3.17? And a sprinkling the hands go up, you know, a decent number. I can quote both because I used to sing the song in church for God so loved the world. And that covers those two verses. So I know those verses off by heart because I used to sing them. And then a guy says, uh, who can quote verse 15. All hands go down. People can quote John 3, 16, and many can quote verse 17. But even though it starts with a four, meaning a conjunction, in this audience of several score people, nobody could quote John 3, 15. So verse 16 is joined onto what comes before. Nobody knows what comes before. They're ignorant of the whole context of John 3.16, right? But then people still say, well, yeah, well, but you said, Jamie, that, that, uh, that, that they don't preach love of God to unconverted people. That was just, you preach God's love to, to converted people. 
He preached the love of God to believers. You don't preach God's love to unbelievers. You're wrong, David, because here, look, verse 16, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, God so loved the world. So if Jesus is preaching to Nicodemus, and by extension, because it's recorded in Scripture, talking to everybody, then there's an illustration of the love of God being preached to an unbeliever. I mean, he was a Jew, of course, but he wasn't a believer in Jesus, not at this stage at least. So he's not a believer. He's unconverted. But Jesus Christ himself is preaching the love of God to Nicodemus. Is that right? Almost certainly no. That would appear to be wrong. Because I'm quite convinced in my own mind that Jesus stopped speaking at verse 15. So when Jesus said, bronze serpent on a pole, even so, son of man, likewise, Jesus stopped the conversation. Verse 16, I'm going to suggest, through to the end of the red letters, which in my Bible is chapter, uh, verse 21, is actually not Jesus at all, even though it's shown in red letters. It's naughty, naughty by the translators. Because I'm pretty convinced that verses 16 through 21, and if yours has got more red letters than that, I'll say that's actually all the Apostle John commenting on Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. It's not Jesus himself, you know, carrying on. Um, because John's comments, I believe, verse 16 onwards, are written to believers. Now, we can do a bit of um, detective work here. Because I think what you find is that uh, after verse 15, the style changes. Up to verse 15, you'll find quite a lot of personal pronouns. I and you and we. After verse 16, they disappear. There's a complete change of style. For example, if you look at uh, uh, just a few illustrations, verse 10, Jesus says, Are you the teacher? Um, verse 11, I say to you, we speak what we know. We testify for what we have seen. You don't receive. You know, a lot of personal pronouns, I and we. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So lots of I's and you's and we's, personal pronouns. After verse 15, they're gone. Don't reappear. So the style completely changes because a conversation, I and me and you and we and you and me and I and you, that suddenly stops. Because now, verse 16, you've actually got the Apostle John commenting and expanding on Jesus teachings and conversation with with Nicodemus. So verse 16, I don't believe is Jesus at all. It's the Apostle John. Another way of looking at it is uh, if you look at verse 16, notice the expression of only begotten son, right? For God so loved the world, or God in this manner, God thus loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Well, Jesus himself never uses that expression to refer to himself, right? When Jesus is talking about he himself, he nearly always uses the expression son of man. In fact, over 80 times Jesus refers to himself as the son of man will do this. When the son of man comes, the son of man will do that. Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. In fact, you can see it there in just verse 13. Look. Uh, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man. That's how Jesus talks of himself. But the expression in verse 16, the only begotten Son, now that's an expression that John the Apostle uses, right? Not one that Jesus uses, but one of John's expressions. You can see that in chapter 1 of John. We'll read verses um, 14 and, uh, and 18. Verse 14, and the Word, talking of the Logos, the Word became flesh and uh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, the Apostle, writing about Jesus, the Word, the only begotten. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, 
he has declared him. So again, John, talking of Jesus, calls him the only begotten son. Now, in some modern translations, they, they don't like that expression, so they use only son, or sometimes uh, the unique son, but that's for theological reasons they choose that. The Greek itself, it just says the only begotten son. And the point I'm making is that John, the apostle, refers to the only begotten son, not Jesus. So in verse 16, we've almost certainly got John, the apostle, starting to expand on Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And it's John who writes, God in this manner loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John writing. That's John explaining to believers. That's not Jesus in verse 16 talking to Nicodemus. And so the rest of John 3, verses 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and all the way through to 36 is all John's commentary, John's explanation, John adding understanding for us, not Jesus preaching about the love of God to an unconverted Nicodemus. Now, a lot of people think that, uh, that John wrote his gospel so that people could believe and that John wrote his gospel primarily for unbelievers. I've seen in the past a number of people who would actually have little uh, Gospels of John. So you might go to a crusade somewhere and a Billy Graham sort would preach. And at the end of it, people would say, I want to be converted. And uh, they'd get a list of local churches to go to you know, Sunday morning. And very often they'd hand out a Gospel of John because it's considered that the Gospel of John is the best gospel to give to unconverted and unbelievers because it talks about the love of God, which they need to hear, and because John himself says that he wrote his gospel to the unconverted. Did he? No, he didn't. But let's look at that. John chapter 20. Second last chapter, John 20. And verses uh, 30 to 31. So John 3 is in the Gospel of John and the story is that the whole Gospel itself is about writing to unconverted unbelievers to bring them into the truth of God, especially the love of God. But notice verses 30-31 uh, of John 20. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So people say, whoa, there it is, verse 31. John says he wrote this that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So it's written to unconverted. That's why we give out these discounted Gospels of John to new believers or people thinking about giving their heart to the Lord. And I've seen that. I've seen them discounted as well. Just the Gospel of John, not the rest of the New Testament, just the Gospel, because John says he wrote it to bring people into the truth. He, he wrote it to make people come to believe that Jesus is Christ. That's what we do, and John 3, 16 is in there somewhere. So it's all par and parcel of that, preaching the love of God to the world. No. Historians will tell you that when John wrote his Gospel, sort of quite late on in the first century, there was a major heresy affecting many believers. And this particular heresy, one of many at the time, uh, was that Jesus was not God. Jesus was not divine. Jesus was just a human being, a pretty good human being, maybe a perfect human being, but he was a human being. He had no pre-existence. He was not God. He was just a very, very good human being. And a number of believers apparently had gone with that view. They accepted that Jesus was just, you know, a fleshly man. And so John actually wrote his gospel, seeing this problem, to try and remind the believers and encourage the believers to go on believing. They'd started believing that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And so 
John wrote the whole gospel to remind them and to reinforce it and to encourage them, keep on believing what you already believe. You've started off well, don't lose it now. Uh, John's gospel, as some will tell you, is written around uh, some framework. There are uh, you know, seven signs appearing in the gospel of John. Um, you know, the marriage feast at Cana was a sign. Uh, the raising of Lazarus was a sign, there were seven signs. There are the seven I am statements that appear in the Gospel of John. I am the bread from heaven. I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world and so on. There are seven witnesses referred to in the Gospel of John. You know, John the Baptist was a witness who testified of Jesus. The scriptures testified of Jesus and so on. So John wrote this book and carefully crafted it to be a help to existing believers, not unconverted, to believers to continue to believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God, not just a human being. If you think about it, even the first verse or two of, of John, it, there's no introduction, it just goes bang, in the beginning was the Word, Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and then later on, he was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So right from verse 1, John is saying, Jesus, the Word, was God in the beginning and all the way through and right to the end. So John's working very hard to say that please continue to believe what you believe already. Verse 31 could be translated, these are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God, not just a human being. And that believing and continuing to believe, you may have life in his name. Don't fall away. Believe he is. Continue to believe he is. In fact, the, the New Living Translation I gets this reasonably well. Uh, verse 31 but these are written so that you may continue to believe, not start to believe. It's not written to unconverted to bring them out of disbelief or unbelief. John wrote this to counter a terrible heresy of the day. No. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Right? So John wrote his gospel to believers. It's believed that Matthew wrote his gospel to believers, in his case, to the Jewish believers. Hence, you find so many references to the Old Testament in the gospel of Matthew to Jewish believers. John to believers. It's probably the case that, that Mark and Luke are the gospels written to unbelievers. To, to, to unconverted. So here we've got a sort of story where John 3.16, one of the most popular scriptures in the whole Bible uh, about how God loves everybody all the time in every way, no matter how bad, wicked or evil they are. And because the message of the Bible is the love of God. Well, actually, it's not. There's hardly any references to the love of God in the Bible, apart from references to God's love for his sons and daughters uh, who have accepted Jesus Christ, you know. So the Bible says very little, one verse out of a thousand. You wouldn't know that listening to so many of today's preachers and TV evangelists. You'd think the Bible is stuffed full of the love of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. It's not there. You know, one verse in a thousand. So John 3.16 Perhaps the most quoted verse in the Bible is actually woefully misunderstood. It doesn't mean at all what people say. It's tied into the previous verses about the bronze serpent on the pole, which if you looked at, you would be delivered from death. And if you didn't look at it, you would die. Jesus has been lifted up on a pole. And if you come to him, look to him in trust, you'll be delivered from death. And if you choose not to look to him, you won't be delivered and you'll perish. Because today, if you're not looking, the wrath of God is hanging over you. 
and one day the wrath of God will drop on you. So there's goodness and severity there in John chapter 3. And I think at the moment, if you have a gospel message which excludes the fear of God, which excludes a warning of the righteous judgment to come, that's a false gospel. And if you want to know whether the gospel of preaching love, 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 love all the time is an effective gospel, just look around our societies. God is not feared. Nobody cares about God. He's excluded from people's lives. Because the gospel of the endless, unconditional love of God is a weak and an impotent gospel. And the evidence is actually all around us. Okay, with that we'll conclude today's message.